Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's City Club Forum. My name is Ralph Delarada, and it's my pleasure this year to serve as president of the City Club of Cleveland. Established in October of 1912, the City Club has served as one of the nation's premier public podiums for civic dialogue, covering the most pressing topics of our time. Our guest speakers, rich in experience and knowledge, are here to spur discussion and learning amongst the citizens of Cleveland as well as our national audience. Today, our speaker is Jeffrey Tubin. Unfortunately, as uh, you may have heard earlier, Jeffrey could not make it to be with us here in person, so we will have uh, Jeffrey uh, with us from an audio basis. Uh, the weather on the East Coast uh, prohibited him from getting here, but uh, I'm sure we can wing this and make it work for everybody, and we're lucky to have such an enlightened and um, interesting uh, journalist, legal journalist as Jeffrey Tubin to be with us today. He is currently an analyst at CNN, where he provides expert legal commentary and analysis for CNN worldwide. He joined CNN in 2002 after seven years as a legal analyst at ABC News. Tubin has provided professional, professional analysis on high profile cases, including the O.J. Simpson trial and the Kenneth Starr investigation of the White House. Tubin notably, notably won an Emmy Award in 2000 for his coverage of the Ilian Gonzalez custody saga. Tubin has also been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 1993, where he has written articles on subjects such as Attorney General John Ashcroft, the dispute over Florida's presidential votes in 2001, the Paula Jones sexual harassment case, the trial of Timothy McVeigh, and the Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas incidents. Prior to his career in journalism, Jeffrey served as an assistant U.S. Attorney General in Brooklyn and as an associate counsel in the Office of Independent Counsel of Lawrence E. Walsh. He received his bachelor's degree from Harvard College and graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where he was an editor of the Harvard Law Review. He has written several critically acclaimed best-selling books, including A Vast Conspiracy, the real story of the sex scandal that nearly brought down a president, as well as the run of his life, the people versus O.J. Simpson, and too close to call the 36-day battle to decide the 2000 election. Jeffrey's most recent book is The Nine, Inside the Secret World of the Supreme Court, which he published in the fall of 2007. This literary piece reveals a behind-the-scenes peek into the nation's most important legal body based on exclusive interviews with the Supreme Court justices themselves. The book spent several months on the New York Times bestseller list and was named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times Book Review, and as well by Time, Newsweek, Fortune, Entertainment Weekly, and The Economist. The book also received the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize for Nonfiction and the Silver Gavel Award of the American Bar Association. In light of this coming year's elections, of this year's coming elections, rather, Tubin writes about the notion that Supreme Court justices interpret the Constitution based on not only legal factors, but also political motivations. Therefore, the coming presidential election will also determine the direction that the Supreme Court will follow. It's a pleasure to introduce such a distinguished and admired figure. Ladies and gentlemen, please give me a warm city club welcome to Jeffrey Tubin. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. Is, is this working? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, terrific. First of all, let me apologize on behalf of myself, I guess, uh, that uh, I, I couldn't be there. I, it's just it's, it's a disastrous travel situation here in New York, and um, <laughs> it looks like I have a debate to cover tonight. Um, as of about half an hour ago, and uh, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry not to be there um, in part. Um, I'm sorry not to see Jim Foster and my old friend and colleague, Jeff Mearns, who was a better prosecutor than I was in, uh, in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn, and my friend and current colleague, Avery Friedman. And I'm sorry in particular not to make my usual pilgrimage to Daleford Road in Shaker Heights, where my mother grew up. So um, I... Uh, there, there we go. A little, a little shout out there for Shaker Heights, and a, and a small round of applause, apparently. Um, but uh, I am... Uh, so, so I'm happy to talk to you through the magic of radio um, about this peculiar moment in the history of the Supreme Court. 
The court is a wonderful institution for a journalist like me because it is at once very well known, very um, familiar to people, yet the justices are almost entirely uh, unfamiliar to people and, 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 and virtually anonymous. And, and the justices themselves recognize that they have this simultaneous public and private status and sometimes uh, even have a little fun with it. And I'll give you an example. For reasons that remain obscure, David Souter and Stephen Breyer are frequently mistaken for each other. Now, if you know what they look like, they don't look anything like each other, but in fact, they are often mistaken for each other. And one time, not too long ago, Justice Souter, as he often does, was driving from Washington to his home in New Hampshire, and he stopped to get something to eat in a little restaurant in, uh, in Massachusetts. So he's there, and a couple comes up to him, and the guy says, I know you. You're on the Supreme Court, right? He says, yes. And the guy says, you're Stephen Breyer, right? And Souter didn't want to embarrass the fellow in front of his wife, so he said, yes, I'm, I'm Stephen Breyer. So they chatted for a little while. But then the guy asked a question that Souter wasn't ready for. He said, so, Justice Breyer, what's the best thing about being on the Supreme Court? He paused for a moment. He said, I have to say it's the privilege of serving with David Souter. Now, how can you not love an institution where, where that's still possible? But the other reason I decided to write the book, other than to capture the wacky wit of David Souter, um, was uh, because the court is, I think, at a potential major, major turning point in its history. And to see why it's such an important turning point, you need to go back to the late 60s. And the late 60s was the last time the court was a unified ideological force. And it was a liberal force. There were seven liberals on the Supreme Court in the late 60s, sort of the last years of Earl Warren's period as Chief Justice. And you really had a court with a liberal agenda on issue after issue, whether it was 1964, uh, New York Times against Sullivan, establishing new protections for, for uh, the press, 1965, Griswold versus Connecticut, uh, establishing the right to privacy and saying that married couples had the right to buy birth control, or 1966, the Miranda decision, revolutionizing criminal law, or in case after case, all through this period, usually unanimously, all the big civil rights cases uh, where the court essentially said to the South, we are dragging you kicking, or, kicking and screaming into the 20th century. But then something peculiar in the history of the court happened. Four justices left in very quick succession, and Richard Nixon got to name all their, uh, all their uh, replacements. It, it's just a quirk of fate. Jimmy Carter is the only president in American history to serve a full term but not have the opportunity to name a single justice to the Supreme Court. Just there were no vacancies. But Richard Nixon was only president for five and a half years. You'll recall he had to leave early. Um, you, you, I'm sure he was in all the papers, you remember. And, uh, he, he, but he got four appointments. Um, the four justices who left were uh, Chief Justice Warren, uh, Justice Black, Justice Harlan, and Justice Fortas. And Richard Nixon named all their replacements. And who did he name? He named Warren Burger, Chief Justice, Harry Blackman, Lewis Powell, and William Rehnquist. And I think if you look at that list, and if you look at the Supreme Court in the 70s, you see something that I think is a theme that I talk a little bit about in the book, but is something I've been thinking a lot about lately, which is the evolution of the Republican Party. The Republican Party of Richard Nixon was a very different institution than the Republican Party of George W. Bush. It was a more moderate party. It was not a party that cared deeply about social issues. It was a uh, distinctly different enterprise than, than the current modern Republican Party. And that, I think, is reflected in uh, Richard Nixon's appointments to the Supreme Court. Because while a lot of people at the time thought that uh, the Nixon justices were going to move the court dramatically to the right, that was not true at all. In fact, the 70s were nearly as liberal as the 60s. Uh, you had decisions like the Nixon tapes case, where they essentially forced Nixon out of office, the Pentagon Papers case, the approval of school busing. They ended the death penalty for all time. Well, they, well, actually for about two years, but they did end the death penalty um, for, for the entire country. And of course, still the most controversial decision of them all, Roe versus Wade, 1973, was a seven to two opinion 